Good afternoon. My name is Alan Friesen. YouTube username Alan the Friesen. I'd like to welcome you to my English 30 1, uh, sorry, English 10 1 and 10 2 class in the lovely place in Southern Alberta. My students have asked me to do an accent today, and I'm not too sure if I'm going to continue with it much longer, but they said it helps them to keep attention. So, for those of you watching at home, don't worry, I haven't suddenly emigrated to Scotland and picked up the language. It's just for fun. Today we're going to be talking about apocalyptic fiction. Apocalyptic. Now apocalyptic is one of those fun words that's difficult to spell and that's because it orig originally comes from the Greek apocalyptic fiction. It comes from the Greek apocalypsis. which means uncovered. Now, for those of you who know a little bit about apocalyptic fiction, you're thinking to yourself, uncovered. What does that have to do with the end of the world? And to tell you the truth, in the original Greek, it did not have anything to do with what we were talking about. At the original meaning, uncovered. We're talking about knowledge revealed. But it's since morphed into two distinct meanings. The first of which is a prophetic foretelling or revelation, and the second is a general term that references the end of the world. One of the reasons, or the reason that we have this crossover is because of the Apocalypse of John. The Apocalypse of John. Oh, that's not good. Apocalypse of John, which you might know as the book of Revelation from the New Testament. Now, when the book was written, it was originally written in Greek, and it had the original title, Apocalypse, or the Apocalypse of John. But since then, they've used the more specific translation of Revelation to be uncovered, knowledge revealed. That's where the meaning of it comes. I'm just going to ask one of my students to sit down. Hey, Godwin, sit down. Now, new chair. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sorry about that, those of you at home. But you get a feel of what it's like in my class on a daily basis. The Apocalypse of John, or the Book of Revelation for the Protestants, it's a crossover between the two different meanings. It's a revelation from God about the end of the world. So let me say that again. It's a revelation from God about the end of the world. And it was about the 12th century, about the 12th century in the common era, some 900 years ago or so, that the meaning of the term moved away from the knowledge revealed and went towards the end of the world. You might not know what the book of Revelation is about. It comes at the very end of the New Testament. It starts off by a man named John who's writing a letter to his brothers because he's in jail. And he says, you need to be careful about this and this and this when you run a church. But at the very end of the book, in fact, the majority of the book, is about this vision that he's had about how the world will end. And it's full of powerful imagery that to this day we still don't fully understand. Which is one of the reasons that I don't teach the book in a grade 10 English class. Aside from the obvious. What is the obvious? I don't know. Regardless, in the book there's this vivid imagery of these plagues coming across and attacking mankind, including locusts, that sting with their tails and poison men to the extent that they cry out and beg to be killed. You have a woman riding on a dragon coming up from the sea, and men fall down and worship her, and she's known as the Whore of Babylon. We don't know what that means or who that's related to. 
And then we've got the figure of the Antichrist, the beast from the pit, the number 666, all of this very vivid imagery that we don't fully understand. Some people believe that this is all to come, literally. Some people believe that it's all to come metaphorically. And some people believe that it refers to events that have already happened. But regardless, it's an image of the world perishing in fire and flame, where the righteous are taken to be with God, and the unrighteous are burned for eternity. Again, like I said, whether or not this is literally or metaphorically true, we don't really know. And depending on what type of Christian you talk to, they'll tell you different things. So that's where the word apocalypse comes from, especially our common meaning, because the Bible has been a hugely influential force in the Western canon, in Western literature, for the last 2,000 years. And in fact, most of the stories we're going to look at are our references, or are allegories of various biblical stories. Now, for our purposes, when we talk about the word apocalypse, we're referring to the end of the world. And we're not going to go too much into the revelation, the uncovering sort of idea. But I thought that you perhaps might like to know the origins of this word, where it comes from. Because I've had students ask me, what is an apocalypse? I know it's like people dying and all, yeah? But really, what is it? So that's what it is. I also need to distinguish between dystopian fiction and apocalyptic fiction. So dystopian, with a D, not a clumsy C. Dystopian. Dystopia and utopia are opposites. Eupotia. That's not right. Oh, the Scottish is messing with my brain. Eupopia. So a utopia is a perfect society where everybody is happy, and a dystopia is the exact opposite. It's an ordered society where people are miserable because the government is oppressing them. In a utopia, the government looks after the people. In a dystopia, the government oppresses the people. The best contemporary example of a dystopia is the Hunger Games which most people here have either read, or seen, or at least know the general plot. In the Hunger Games, you have the capital that's imposing its will on the other 12 districts. And every year extracts from them two tributes, asks for one girl and one boy in order to fight to the death. And the purpose of this is to remind the districts of the revolution that attempted to happen before, and to let them know that they are under the control of the central, I'm sorry, central district, head district, whatever it's called, under the, under the control of the capital. It's dystopian because people are suffering. They don't have enough to eat. They're being oppressed. But it's also a post, oh, sorry, it's also an apocalyptic text because it happens after some sort of unnamed disaster. You, not, you should not confuse the two. Dystopian is bad, bad government oppressing the people. Apocalyptic literature can have a good government or a bad one. It doesn't necessarily matter. So dystopian and apocalyptic, they're both futuristic. They both take place in the future. It's both usually revolving around some sort of disaster, but the apocalyptic one looks at the disaster and the dystopian one looks at government control. So like I said, something can be both dystopic and it can be apocalyptic. For our purposes, we're going to be focusing on the apocalyptic. And for that matter, we also need to make the distinction about apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic fiction. Although, for our purposes, we're not going to go too much into the difference, but I need to explain it so that you get it. So post-apocalyptic and apocalyptic. The 
difference between the two is not complicated. An apocalyptic text is one where the world is ending within the context of the story. A post-apocalyptic text is one that takes place after the destruction. That's really the difference. In some of the stories we're going to look at, it's, it's pre-apocalyptic. It's just before the world is being destroyed. Or it's, it's just as it's happening, which fits more with this. This one is more fantastical sometimes. It's more darker. That's, in here, in a post-apocalyptic scenario, that's where you get the blur between dystopia and apocalyptic fiction. But like I said, for our purposes, we're not going to differentiate between the two of them that much. But if you're doing a Google search, if you're looking for apocalyptic fiction, if you also search for post-apocalyptic fiction, or books, or novels, or whatnot, you'll widen your net quite a bit more. So one of the inquiry questions that I work through with my students is the question, why do we tell stories about the end of the world? And I'm going to pause it here because I've got a phone call. Thank you.